So carbohydrates, these are um, the top five carbohydrate sources for U.S. adults in recent years. This is kind of scary in my opinion. Um, white bread, soda, cookies, and cakes are the top three. And then you have sugar and syrups, followed by jams and potatoes. So basically the only good thing on there are the potatoes at the very bottom. But I'm going to guess that's not in the form of potatoes. That's probably more like potato chips and french fries and things like that. And this is U.S. adults. These are not children eating these things. These are the adults drinking those 44 gallons of soda per year. Uh, scary. So what are the recommendations for carbohydrate intake? Uh, the latest dietary recommendations, okay, are to consume a minimum of 130 grams of carbohydrates a day. This is recommended by the United States government. 130 grams minimum. There's no maximum to the amount of carbohydrates they recommend that you intake. Okay, so as far as science is concerned, it's totally the opposite. You should be eating no more than 100 grams of carbohydrates a day. Now, I'm just going to ask you this quick question. Why is it that the government is telling you to eat a minimum of 130 grams of carbohydrates while your scientists are telling you to don't eat any more than 100 grams of carbohydrates? What could the possible reason for this be? Katie, you seem so <laughs> negative about this. Money. Money. Money, 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 honey. Okay, probably. Um, there are a lot of political and financial ramifications to all of this, and um, you know, there's a lot of big industry in food, and so they want you to become addicted, and it's sugar, carbohydrates, are more addicting than cocaine. Did you know that? I did some really interesting studies with rats. And what they did is they gave these rats sugar, and they gave these rats cocaine. So we'll start out with the cocaine. They gave the rats cocaine, and the rats became addicted to the cocaine. Then what they did is they put these poor little rats into this cage. And on one side of the cage, and how they gave them the cocaine was in their water. So on one side of the cage is their water supply with their cocaine in it, so they can get their fix. And they put the little rat on the opposite side of the cage, and then they electrified the floor of the cage to see if the rat would go across the floor to get the cocaine. The rats died. They would not go across that floor, and that was their only source of any kind of water, and they would rather die. They're not going to get electrified for that. But now they got these other rats addicted to sugar. And they did the same thing. Put a little rat on one side of the cage, electrified the floor, put the sugar water on side. Those rats would run across that electric floor, which was at very high voltage, and shock and burn themselves with all this electricity to get to that sugar. Hmm. Guess what that means about how sugar affects us. And it's so very easy to become addicted to this and it makes you want to buy and buy and buy more of the product. So there is a lot of money and a lot of politics in how many carbs you eat. So we're looking at what the nutrition is for the body, and about 100 grams for adults uh, is pretty normal. If you're trying to lose weight again or a person is diabetic, we're looking at less grams of carbs. Uh, and for a diabetic, uh, Unfortunately for them, you're looking at under 30 grams of carbs a day. Now some of your type 2 diabetics actually may be able to come back from diabetes and kick diabetes if they haven't burnt their pancreas out too much. Uh, because they've just exhausted the pancreas and if they can get rid of all those excess carbs in their diet, their pancreas may have the opportunity to heal. 
So it's really good to try to get your uh, diabetic patients on a low carbohydrate diet. And then of course the best sources of carbohydrates for us are the plant-based foods, the non-processed foods. Uh, but then you have all these whole grains as well that are um, recommended for you to eat simply because it has a lot of fiber in it. Okay, So this is a, like a wheat grain and you have what's called the bran on the outside and then you have the endosperm and you have the germ. Okay. The whole grain is where you eat the entire kernel. So they actually crush this all up in the wheat. And then there's a lot of fiber in this as well as the carbohydrates. If you have refined grain, okay, what they're doing is they're stripping the bran layer off. If you've ever eaten plain bran, you know why. It's not a really tasty morsel. A lot of people don't like it. But the problem again is much of your B vitamins, iron, those phytochemicals we've talked about before, even the dietary fiber is gone when you refine your grains. And so they have to go back and they have to enrich the grains and add all of this to it after the fact just so that they can have the right taste that they want you to have. So foods for fat loss. If you're going to eat your carbs, these are the ones to eat. And you don't see any processed stuff in there, right? So your leafy, colorful vegetables, followed by your berries, especially. And then you can add your starches in there. Sweet potatoes have a very low uh, stimulus for insulin. Now, here's the reason we care about stimulus of insulin. So anytime insulin rises, okay, so you have an increase in insulin for whatever reason, you're going to have an increase in fat storage. So that means that when we increase insulin, we don't have the ability to burn fat as our energy source, which makes sense. Because when insulin goes up, it's because we're burning glucose as an energy source or carbohydrates as an energy source. Why would you want to waste the fat burning? You don't need it. So when insulin is up, we don't burn fat. So if you have a patient who needs to lose extra fat off of their body, you don't want them to keep spiking their insulin levels or they won't be able to burn fat as an energy source. This is also why it's very difficult for your diabetic patients to keep their weight down and to not have as much fat on the body because their insulin levels are usually higher than a non-diabetic patient be, or yeah, non-diabetic patient because they have to keep giving themselves that external insulin to keep their levels down. So when you're trying to have your patient lose the excess fat on their body, you want to keep the spikes of insulin down, which means not eating those really extremely high carb uh, packed like Snickers bars, okay? You don't want them eating that processed food. So the natural sugars versus the added sugars versus the sugar substitutes, we need to talk about those. So the taste buds typically can't distinguish between these sugars, although I can tell you tasting like the yellow versus the pink versus the blue versus the green, I think they have very distinct taste, but it affects our brain pretty much the same way. Um, so foods with natural sugars generally provide more calories, more nutrient energy, uh, and then these other sugars, depending on the type they are, they can still spike an insulin response. So what a lot of people think is if I'm using the yellow, the blue, or the pink, or whatever, I'm not going to get fat off of that. The problem is that they could still, because they're still getting this insulin response, depending on what kind of artificial sugar they're using. So natural sugars we talked about, those are monosaccharides, disaccharides, polysaccharides for the sweeteners. And 14.6% 14 of our total energy intake is from added sugar. That's the average American. 60% of this comes from sugar sweetened beverages, uh, desserts, and fruit drinks. 
And then, of course, high fructose corn syrup, which we've talked about that, tastes even sweeter than glucose. So alternative sweeteners, they're not going to give us any calories or very few calories. They are not metabolized by bacteria in the mouth, so they're less likely to cause dental uh, cavities, for instance. And they cause, if they cause a spike in insulin, a lot of times it's because um, the spike, excuse me, the spike is not as great because they don't raise the blood glucose levels as much, but they still can cause a spike. Okay, so saccharin, that's the pink packet. Uh, this is um, a polyol, so that polyalcohol, that sugar alcohol. So this is sugar with an alcohol component to it. Uh, and so saccharin was discovered about a century ago. And in 1977, saccharin was banned because there was a study that was done giving saccharin to rats. And those rats got cancer. Now, this is why it's important that you understand these studies and read these studies for yourself because one of the things they did is they gave these rats a million times more saccharin than the average person would have taken in their lifetime. So, okay, yeah, that might cause cancer. Uh, and so eventually they redid those studies giving the rats the same percentages that a person would drink over their lifetime and lo and behold, there was no cancer that happened. Uh, aspartame. This is the blue packet. Okay, this is another type of sugar substitute. And in our body, it behaves more like a protein than a carbohydrate. It is 200 times sweeter than sucrose or the table sugar. So this is the equal. Uh, there are some people who cannot metabolize aspartame. Uh, they don't have the right enzymes to do it, so they have to be very careful to stay away from aspartame. Aspartame is what you find in like diet sodas. Um, it is recommended that you don't have more than eight packets of Equal a day. That's a lot. Uh, there was a study that was just published yesterday, which is really interesting, and they were looking at the percentages of fat on a person's body who drinks regular soda versus the percentage of fat on a person's body who drinks diet soda, and there was no difference. So that's kind of an interesting, you know, we all think about diet soda as, oh, let's drink that diet soda because hey, we're going to lose weight and you know stay thin because of the diet soda. But typically, people who drink lots of diet soda and lots of soda will have very equal percentages of fat. So something's going on that uh, is not really helping like it's supposed to. Oh, sorry. Let me go back to that. This is what I wanted to show you. The disease that they have that uh, they're not able to break down uh, aspartame is called phenylketonuria. So they can't... Um, metabolize the amino acids in aspartame and so they absolutely cannot drink this stuff or eat this stuff because it will kill them. It will build up in their system. Sucralose or Splenda, this is the yellow packet uh, and it can't be broken down or absorbed by our body although there are some studies to say that it spikes our insulin levels and these studies have shown that it spikes our insulin levels twice as high as what sucrose could do. So if you drink an iced tea and you put regular sugar in the iced tea, and then you drink an iced tea with Splenda, you're going to have more of an insulin response with the Splenda than you would with the sugar. This is 600 times sweeter than sucrose. So maybe this is why you have that big insulin response. So um, a daily recommended amount, no more than, of sucralose is about 30 packets of Splenda a day. It's supposed to be okay for you. This is equal to six cans of diet soda because a lot of diet sodas will have Splenda in it now instead of aspartame. I don't recommend that many packets a day. Stevia. Now, they're offering stevia sometimes at the restaurants. Now that's in the green packet. Okay. Uh, this is derived from a South American shrub. 
and it's 100 to 300 times sweeter than sucrose. It does not provide any energy. Our body is not able to absorb it, but because it is so sweet, we do have uh, an insulin response to stevia as well. So how do we digest and absorb carbohydrates? Um, basically what's going to happen is we're going to start the digestive process in the mouth. So does anybody remember what the name of the enzyme in the mouth is that helps to start digesting carbohydrates? Amylase. Amylase. Very good. So in order for our body to be able to use any of these complex carbohydrates, what we're going to have to do is break apart every single one of these glucose molecules and then we can use each individual glucose molecule as a source of energy. And that's what amylase can start doing. It has the ability to break down these complex carbohydrates into the simple monosaccharides so that we'll be able to absorb those. So all of this starts in the mouth. Now there is an amylase that is derived from the pancreas so that when the food does get into the small intestine, uh, the complex carbohydrates can be further dissolved. Okay. Now our villi, you remember in the small intestine you have all those villi and then you have those microvilli. So you're looking at the inside of the small intestine and it sort of looks like hills and valleys. These are the villi and then on top of them are these other little hills and valleys. These are the microvilli. So the glucose, sucrose, all those, lactose, uh, they are all going to be broken down by enzymes that are secreted by the cells that come off of our villi. These are enzymes that break out of the microvilli and they're able to digest the um, chemicals down even more. So this is especially lactose, that milk sugar. It's digested in the small intestine and it uses an enzyme called lactase. Um, there are some people who don't make that enzyme. Lucky you. So what happens is you have these two molecules that are bonded together and they have to be separated by this enzyme. The bond has to break so that we use each of these monosaccharides separately as an energy source. If they remain bonded together, they can't be absorbed into the bloodstream, they can't be absorbed into the cell, we can't use them as an energy source. So instead, they get to stay inside somebody's small intestine and it begins to ferment. So it's kind of like, has your milk ever gone bad? You leave it out and it gets all curdly and it goes bad. And you know, uh, if you leave it out long enough, it starts to form some CO2 bubbles and those bubbles start to form in somebody's small intestine and you know curdled milk does not smell all that well so those bubbles in the small intestine find their way out into the environment and the people around you are not real happy with you after you eat a milk product it's just not a lot of fun for you or your neighbors okay so this is a problem if they don't make the appropriate enzymes to help to break down these carbohydrates and then, of course, if the type of carbohydrate is a fiber now, uh, it reaches the colon, and we may or may not be able to digest that at all. So some of those fibers, the bacteria can metabolize just a little bit, and then be able to use those as uh, a source of energy for the bacteria, uh, but not for us. So glucose and galactose, these are able to go across the small intestine wall and then into the bloodstream. Uh, fructose is also absorbed, but glucose goes across like active transport. You remember that one? Uh, fructose by facilitated diffusion. What's active transport again? Low concentration to high concentration, right? And facilitated diffusion? High concentration to low concentration. Y'all have to remember that. 
That's going to be a test in your nursing program, too. You have to know all that diffusion, active transport stuff. Um, carbohydrates are transported once they get absorbed through the wall of the small intestine into your bloodstream. They're going to be transported directly to your liver. And your liver is going to make some decisions about these carbohydrates. Should I let these carbohydrates go into the bloodstream? Or should I store those carbohydrates away as glycogen? So if the liver figures, oh no, you have enough carbohydrates in your bloodstream, you don't need any more, I'm just going to store the extra away as glycogen, that process is called glycogenesis. Genesis means to make something. So this is making glycogen, and we're going to convert glucose into these long branching chains, and we're going to make this into glycogen. So it's stored for later. Okay. Now, if we have way too many glucose molecules, so we've got plenty in the bloodstream, we've stored in the liver and the muscles all the glycogen we can possibly store, but we still have lots of glucose molecules that the liver needs to figure out, what the heck am I going to do with this? Those glucose molecules are then converted into glycerol and fatty acids. And glycerol and fatty acids form what we call triglycerides. And triglycerides are what we call extra cushion, okay? <laughs> that extra fat that we store in those adipose cells. By the way, when our body converts carbohydrates into a di totally different kind of chemical, which is fat, what do we call that kind of synthesis? Oh, very good. That's de novo synthesis. Excellent. I'm testing your physiology responses here. Let's see if you remember this stuff. For some of you, it's just like last semester. <laughs> All right. So carbohydrates, for, primarily in the form of glucose, provide about half of the energy that our muscles need. Okay, and then our other tissues. The rest will come mainly from fats. And again, most of this is going to be during times of heavy movement. So eating carbohydrate-rich foods helps maintain blood glucose and prevent glycogen breakdown. So glycogen being broken down into glucose is called glycogenolysis. So glycogenolysis is taking glycogen, cutting it up, into individual glucose molecules. Carbohydrates also spare protein. So if sufficient carbohydrates are not available, the body will then start to break down your own proteins and convert amino acids into glucose. And this is called gluconeogenesis. This is not a good thing. We see this mainly on starvation type diets. So I don't want to break my body's proteins down because those proteins are going to be things like my heart and my skeletal muscles, my hair, connective tissue, my bones. That's not a good thing. So when we have people who are on these starvation diets, unfortunately this does happen to them. They will break protein down so that they can convert the amino acids into carbohydrates. Now, um, we're going to talk about this a little bit more next week, but there is a diet that you've probably heard about by now called the ketogenic diet. And this is where the person eats more fat in their diet and less carbohydrates. And one of the questions is, is eating so few carbohydrates a good thing for the body? Uh, or is this a bad thing? Because they're eating on average about, in order to lose weight, about 20 grams of carbs a day. But they also usually, people on a ketogenic diet, have a tendency to eat more meat, okay, than people who are not on that diet. So they're eating more meat. Now, we know meat is protein. So that protein, that excess protein that they're eating, the body will then say, oh, okay, so they're not eating so many carbs 
but they're eating more protein. Let me take some of that protein and go through this process of gluconeogenesis, and I'm going to convert the amino acids from the protein into the carbs the body needs. So that you don't have to actually consume those carbs, but you can actually turn protein into carbs. So this is another kind of neat little trick your body is able to do to make sure that your carb levels are up. Now, of course, if not, I'm not consuming a lot of carbs in my diet and I also don't increase my protein intake, now I'm in trouble because my body will literally leach my own protein and break it away. And if you've ever seen like concentration camp victims and what they look like, there's not a lot of muscle on their body, okay? Because the body is going through this process of gluconeogenesis. So carbohydrates also will help to prevent what's called ketosis. Okay, so you may have heard of something called ketoacidosis. And we really don't see this much in any other kind of disease except for a person who has uncontrolled diabetes. So let's think about this. If I get to use carbohydrates as an energy source for my cells, because I don't have diabetes, but now I have a patient who does have diabetes and they can't use this carbohydrate as an energy source for their cell because it's not controlled. Okay, I have uncontrolled diabetes in this patient. Where is my patient going to get energy from? If they cannot use carbohydrates, even if they're eating tons of it, they can't use carbohydrates as their energy source because they don't have insulin. Where are they going to get their energy from? Fats. Muscle and fat. They will break down muscle uh, because it used to be a long time ago, uh, diabetes used to be called the wasting disease. And you would see people who had long-term uncontrolled diabetes get smaller and smaller and smaller and thinner and thinner and thinner. So they would break down lots of fat and they would break down lots of muscle. Well, anytime you break down too much fat too quickly, you produce a waste product called ketones or ketone bodies. If I produce tremendous amounts of these ketone bodies, well, I can become what we call acidotic or I can go into acidosis because ketones are acidic. And when I go into acidosis, lots of acid in my body means the pH of my body drops. Now what happens to my body when the pH drops too much? What's the major cause when my pH drops? What's going to, I should say, what's going to happen as a major cause of my pH dropping? Inflammation. Proteins denature. What does that mean? They break down. Now, they can break down enough, I go into a coma, or I have kidney failure, or a number of other issues can occur because my proteins are breaking down so much. But we only see this kind of ketoacidosis occurring in uncontrolled diabetes. They're breaking down too much fat too quickly. Okay, so you can have some ketone bodies floating around. We all do. And even if you don't eat a lot of carbs and you use fat more as an energy source, you have more ketone bodies, but you don't go into ketoacidosis. You don't get all those side effects from it. This is when your ketones are super high and create a change in your pH, which is very bad for the body. Okay, so let's talk about insulin and glucagon. These are two major hormones that are going to help us to maintain the glucose levels in our system. So you know when glucose levels go up, insulin levels go up. And insulin's job is to help to open the gates on our cell so that glucose can leave our blood, get into the cell, and help us to make that ATP energy. Okay? But what about if I don't have enough glucose floating around in my bloodstream if my glucose levels are too low? That's where glucagon comes in. 
What glucagon does is it stimulates the liver. Okay? So if I have high glucose, that's going to create high insulin. And then glucose enters the cell. So that I can make energy. But if I have low glucose levels, now of course I'm talking about glucose levels in our blood, okay? Then what that's going to do is that's going to stimulate an increase in glucagon. Now both glucagon and insulin are made by the pancreas, okay? Now what glucagon does is it affects the liver and causes glycogenolysis. So that is glycogen in the liver breaking down to glucose. And then, of course, that means that the glucose can enter into the cell. So insulin levels will go up and glucose goes into the cell. But this is if I haven't been able to eat since like yesterday and so I need to increase my carbs in my bloodstream. That's when we're going to see glucose or glucagon go up. Now, we have a couple other hormones that are going to help with the regulation of insulin, or excuse me, of glucose. Talked about insulin. I don't want to talk about that right this second. Where are those other hormones? Did I lose them? Okay, well, I guess I'm going to talk about those in a minute. So let me just go back, and I'll just tell you what those are, and then we'll go through those. Uh, we have epinephrine and norepinephrine cortisol, and growth hormone. So we'll get to those in just a second. I guess I got my slides out of order. I apologize for that. So we talked about insulin. It goes up when glucose goes up. helps glucose enter into the cell. It can also direct the liver to store glucose as glycogen. And when glycogen stores are full, excess glucose can be converted to those fats which is called lipogenesis. And fat breakdown is inhibited by insulin. And the reason being is that insulin turns off the activity of an enzyme called lipase. Lipase helps to break down fat in order to be able to use for energy. But if insulin levels are up, lipase levels are down. And so that's why we can't break apart fat. So we talked about glucagon stimulates that glycogenolysis in the liver. And without proper carbohydrate intake, glucagon uh, in the liver, or that should say glycogen stores in the liver are depleted in about 10 to 18 hours after uh, fasting or even with uh, exercise. These are just some of the things we've gone over. Oh, there's my slide. So epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, and norepinephrine come from the adrenal glands, and they both stimulate glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. And these are going to raise blood glucose levels. So they're going to stimulate breakdown of glycogen by the liver. That's glycogenolysis. And they're going to stimulate proteins being broken down and converting the amino acids to glucose. So the whole idea is epinephrine and norepinephrine are going to increase glucose levels in the blood. Cortisol is a stress hormone, just like epinephrine and norepinephrine. They're stress hormones too. And cortisol stimulates gluconeogenesis, just like epinephrine and norepinephrine. So muscles will break down and you'll increase blood glucose levels. So interestingly enough, the more stressed out a person is, the lower their muscle mass will be. Growth hormone conserves glucose by stimulating fat breakdown for energy instead. So all of these are helping to increase glucose levels in the blood or at least conserve the amount of glucose in the blood uh, by either breaking down glycogen, breaking down proteins, or breaking down fat so that we have enough energy. Now one other thing is hypoglycemia, and this is where blood glucose levels drop below normal. The pancreas stops releasing insulin until the glucose levels return to normal. 
Now the interesting thing is that a lot of people who have hypoglycemia uh, will go on to become uh, diabetic. And what we see is that the pancreas is not able to regulate insulin appropriately. So they may make too much insulin, which lowers their blood glucose levels so much they become hypoglycemic, okay? Uh, and this is usually a uh, sign, a precursor for diabetes. So eating or drinking carbohydrate-rich foods stimulate that insulin and could cause such an insulin response that it causes you to become more hypoglycemic. So, to not get too much of an insulin response, you have to watch what's called your glycemic index. So there's certain foods that they have indicated a glycemic index. So the higher the glycemic index in the foods I eat, the greater the insulin response is going to be in my body. So I want to eat foods with low glycemic index so I don't burn out my pancreas. Okay, so since Americans aren't good at that, we usually eat a lot of high glycemic <coughs> things, we're having a tendency to burn our pancreas out much quicker. Uh, it is estimated that 50% of the children who reach the age of 11 this year, by the time they are 18, will have diabetes. 50%. That's huge, folks. That's just ginormous. I mean, it's just terrible. Uh, so high insulin can cause high blood triglycerides, too much fat in the blood, uh, increased fat synthesis in the liver, which we call fatty liver disease, uh, increased fat storage in our cells, uh, increased tendency for blood clotting, more rapid return to being hungry. So the higher your spikes of insulin, the increased hunger you're going to have. And then, of course, can stimulate type 2 diabetes in some people over time. So the glycemic index uh, is something that a lot of doctors will recommend that you pay attention to so that all of those things don't happen. These are also foods that are not only low in spiking your insulin, uh, but they're also high in fiber, so it keeps as much glucose entering into the bloodstream. So glucose obviously would have 100% glycemic index, okay? You put that in your bloodstream and you're going to have an insulin response. Um, potatoes, especially mashed potatoes, because there's not a lot of fiber in mashed potatoes, you can see the glycemic index is pretty high. Um, ice cream not quite as high as mashed potatoes. Now, this doesn't mean that ice cream is better for you than mashed potatoes. That's not what this is saying, okay? The ice cream, although it might taste really good, it doesn't have the nutrients in it that the potatoes would have. Now, mashed potatoes, if you're making those from a box, pretty much have no nutrients. If you're actually mashing the potato yourself, that's something different. But then look at like oat bran bread. That's going to have a low glycemic index because there's a lot of fiber in that because of the oats. It holds the glucose from getting into your bloodstream. Okay, so this chart is only telling you the types of foods that spike your insulin levels more or less, not telling you that these foods are better for you. Okay. Here's another chart with glycemic index. So for instance, broccoli has a glycemic index of 10. That's really low, okay? Um, mushrooms, 10. Peas have a glycemic index of 48 because peas do have some sugar in them. But still, compared to soda or to donuts or jelly beans, that's not so bad, okay? Um, dates. Wow. Ooh. Very high glycemic index. So if you're trying to make sure that your insulin levels are not spiking for whatever reason, you probably don't want to eat a lot of dates because this mo probably most likely are dried dates, okay? And dates are very high in sugar. They're excellent for you if you're not eating an American diet. I mean, dates have been used as survival food 
for centuries and they're really good survival food but they're not really good if you're eating candy bars and donuts with your dates okay <laughs> uh, chocolate milk check that out glycemic index of only 35 okay compared to a date but I'm going to also guess that the date has more nutrients in it than chocolate milk okay so you're balancing this with your vitamins your minerals your nutrients and how much it is or is not spiking your blood sugar so you have to think about this when you're working with your diabetic patients or you're working with your patients who are trying to lose weight the more it spikes your blood sugar the higher the glycemic index the less likely you're going to burn fat on your body so what is it that your patient is trying to do what are they trying to accomplish this is what you have to really be looking out for all right so we're going to stop right here. Let's take a 10 minute break and then come on back again.